All right, folks, it's time for Shiny Side Out with David Dunger and Mecky. You're listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Take it away, guys. Welcome to Shiny Side Out with Dave. And Mackie. <laughs> we are coming to you live from the Freedom Slip Sydney studios as one piece of the information super puzzle and revolution radio on freedomslips.com. You can talk to us in the chat room while we're on air. We are live. Follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook to get updates between shows and check out shinysideout.net for our show archive show notes and links we paste into the chat during the show. Get one of these apps for your smart device. Revolution Radio, made by Hawk. Talkstream Live, TuneIn.com. I have that one on my phone. And a Hawk's one, clearly. And a new one, Radio Tuna, Radio T-U-N-A.com. You can also purchase a Grace to- uh, Tabletop Radio, or what we prefer you to is jump in the chat room on freedomslips.com and join us in the chat. If you're in the US, you can call in 347 688 2902, or if you've got Skype, you can add Freedom Screen. This is, is this show number 74? 70 and 4! <laughs> yes, it is. Do you know what? Um, we have a special guest today, and uh, I, I want him for as long as we can have him, so let's try and keep this really, really, really tight. Yep, let's go. We, we have a special guest, Stan Deo. He's held above top secret security clearance and worked undercover for the FBI. He was part of an exclusive black project headed by Dr. Edward Teller, specializing in the development of flying saucer technology. I am not kidding. That's real. He's a super special guy. And you know what? I think we're going to talk about lots of stuff today. Okay. Let's see if we've got him on the line. Stan, are you with us? Hello, Australia. Yes, I'm here. Brilliant. How are you doing? Well, we're pretty good over here in a drought, but uh, I don't know how you're doing over there. You getting rain or are you in a drought? We're getting rained on quite a bit <laughs> at the moment. We, we finished a 10-year drought. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, half your luck, mate. Half your luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, one thing really good came from it, and that was the legislation um, which made it mandatory to have water tanks. Yes. Yeah, well, before Holly and I left uh, our farm over in Victoria there at Miner's Rest, they were talking about putting rain gauges on our water tanks. Of course, we, we lived off of the water tanks we collected from the rain, and they were going to charge us for the rain that we caught from the sky. Oh, you know, no. Yeah. That's yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Dave. There, there was legislation. Afoot, and th- I, think, I think it's now been enacted, to be honest with you. Huh. No, I don't think they did do that, but they threatened to do it, and, of course, we were all ready to storm the Bastille. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> uh, which, which, which brings us to another th- thing. Now, you've, you've lived in Australia, Stan, and I understand that you've got a fairly close connection to Australia. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I lived there for 30 years, from 1971 to 2001, and uh, I hold uh, dual citizenship. In fact, I spent more time as an adult in Australia than I did in America. Huh. There you go, listeners. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. amazing. So, so what were you doing here? Well, um, long story, but the short end of it is that I was on a classified um, uh, joint American, English, uh, Canadian, uh, Russian, German, Australian project to develop flying saucers. And so I was sent down there to do my part. So this is interesting, uh, Stan. Uh, now, obviously, we, we talk a lot about Australia and, and the re- relative remoteness of, of our country. Um, so there the seem to be... A, there seems to be quite a lot going on. So from what you said, there seem to be secret projects going on here. Is this quite common that Australia is being used as a testing ground and such? Oh, yes. Look, uh, back in 1961, uh, 61 I believe it was, uh, right around there, uh, Pine Gap, they started uh, measuring where they wanted to put that, and they put up some uh, balloons on, you know, just uh, on wires um, over Alice Springs there. And they flew aircraft around it for for days and days and days trying to figure out the best point for the um, transmitting aerial to go for what they were doing for low frequency broadcast. When they did finally do it, then they started uh, Pine Gap. But before that even, they'd had work out at uh, Exmouth um, at uh, the Lermouth Project mm. and um, U.S. Navy had. We had uh, uh, what's, uh, you know, like with the um, Pine Gap, we had a peppercorn agreement. Uh, you know, it was I, do you know what a peppercorn agreement is? No. Yeah, no. 
Okay. Well, between Australia and the United States, we uh, had an agreement to let us put uh, base one, base two, whatever. And it was a, um, the fee for it was one peppercorn. So basically it was just a technical term to let us have it uh, by a handshake. Oh, huh. and, right. Gotcha. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, I don't know what we've got there now, but uh, Pine Gap was one of the most important ones uh, for our uh, transceiving of information from the United States over into the Middle East. Uh, it was just a transceiver link back and forth so that we could have very strong, secure communications with our forces and uh, embassies over in that area. There were some other uses for it, as I explained in the Cosmic Conspiracy book. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, if you go onto Google Earth, and get over there to the Exmouth uh, Peninsula at the very tip of it and zoom right in, you'll see 13 towers, uh, you know, Tower Zero being in the middle and then six in the next ring, six in the next ring. Mm-hmm. And that was our biggest base. There was a Tesla transmitter that could talk to our submarines uh, underwater a long way away. And that used to generate, oh, I think it was uh, either three or eight megawatts. I can't remember now then with the generators there. And sometimes when the conditions were right, the locals would see St. Elmo's fire or glows in the air around the antenna. And it was quite a spectacular thing because the antenna was like, you know, a mile across. It's, it's big. Mm, my, my friend's been over there and taken photos from the horizon <clears throat> of, of, of the antenna array. And, and we always believed that it was like the beginning of HARP. Once we saw HARP come out, we, we thought, so, you know, maybe there's something connected those two together. They did have similar uh, features uh, in some respects, but um, the the Exmouth project had, uh, they did several tests of it beforehand. If you'll come back down the coast, uh, down the peninsula there, you'll see other tests that were done. You'll see the the, the trademark uh, or the telltale circular posts and stuff, and you'll see that they built several of them before they decided on the the big one there. Um, But these kind of transmitters are are different to HARP in this respect. HARP is aimed to, to be used straight up through the atmosphere into the ionosphere. Mm-hmm. The, the Tesla type transmitter is actually set up to set up a standing wave that you modulate all over the planet, you know, from, from that point to the antipodal point on the other side of the planet. And the waves bounce back and forth, back and forth, and they build up a, a standing wave pattern, and then they put an audio modulation on it or text mm-hmm. or, you know, secret uh, transmissions. And submarines can pick it up with a trailing antenna. In fact, it's so strong in some places, you can actually recharge some of the batteries on the submarine from the signal you're getting. Wow. That is incredible. Now, now, that's different, as I say, than HARP. Uh, that's not addressing the ionosphere. That's setting up a, an atmospheric, uh, a sub-atmospheric standing wave. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I've still got a few of the capacitors from the, uh, from the facility there that they managed to sneak out for us. And, you know, each capacitor is like, oh weighs a few pounds and it's it's a vacuum thing you can tune it up to 30,000 volts and uh, it was uh, you know it's kind of nice to hold a bit of history in your hands it always is absolutely I've, I'm actually looking at a picture of, of this as well um, it's it's like an amazing kind of construction the um, Exmouth side I mean um, it's it's really and it, it's more advanced than the one that's in Alaska people say at least right um, is that true it's a different kind of antenna and broadcast system the one in Alaska, which is on holiday at the moment, they're waiting for some more funding. Um, the one in Alaska is one of about eight that are publicly known uh, on the planet. Other countries have them too. And uh, if you'll no- notice the array there, if you get close-up pictures of the mm-hmm. Harp array, you'll see that they don't look anything like what you've no, got in the X-Mouth right. Peninsula. So they're, they're different kettle of fish, different uh, uh, uses, different intended uses. The Harp facility can be used, or one like that, can be used to pump uh, electricity up into the upper atmosphere, into the ionosphere, and under certain conditions, they can cause that electricity to store in the ionosphere and then discharge over a given target somewhere else on the planet. So you can actually cause lightning, if you wish, to drop down out of the sky, out of a clear blue sky, on a target, or reasonably close to it, depends on how Mm -hmm. our system is. And that's the, that's the beauty of that, I guess, the beauty of the function of the HARP-type uh, uh, research antenna and broadcast system, uh, among other things. But it does ionize the channel up to the ionosphere and allows you to connect straight to the uh, ionosphere and use it like a, like a wire in the sky to communicate with other 
similar type transmitters and receivers uh, and with targets. That is incredible. Um, can I ask you is, is something about the Pine Gap as well? Sorry, we, we have um, well a lot of information on it, nothing concrete, um, and no Australians are really allowed in there, no civilians certainly. Um, what, what is happening at Pine Gap and how deep underground does it go? Well, I don't know these days, but I know the original uh, well that was dug underneath uh, for the antenna grounding went down five miles. It was the deepest water well the Australian driller had ever drilled there. Five miles? Um, yeah, it was mainly for, for grounding and, and, and some other purposes for the transmitter to reach submarines. But uh, as you go down in the in the central area, it's underground, of course. As you go down, there's um, a security areas A, B, and C. And unless you're born uh, in area A, you don't get there. Mm -hmm. uh, and along the hallways in the the uh, each area A, B, and C, there are colored stripes running down the hallway. And if your badge color matches that, then you're allowed there. If it doesn't, and security catches you, you're dead. Oh, no questions asked. There's about 1,200 people usually, 12 to 1,500 people in staff, and I'd say, oh gosh. Maybe it used to be about 50, 60 percent of them were Australian. Uh, the American and other uh, technicians that were flown over um, varied from American to German, French, some, you know, some other things that were being done there. But primarily they were American. And, uh, you know, back in the, in the days of Gough Whitlam, when, when he was the, the prime minister there, um, there was a staff sergeant, uh, an Air Force staff sergeant that was found under his bed there on the base and he had committed suicide with an electric heater under the bed if you can believe that wow <laughs> and it was very suspect because he was uh, allegedly the guy leaking out information of what was inside pine gap uh, to australian personnel because as you know they don't tell you anything down there mm -hmm. and i as i say i wear two hats being a you know, dual citizen so i can understand the uh, the australian people being a bit curious about what's going on there and others, uh, Nurngar is closed now, but um, some of the ABO reports that, I mean, I had delivered directly to me from them, talked about seeing, well, flying saucers, you know, bright uh, silvery disc-shaped things popping up on the west side of the McDonald and the Musgrave ranges mm -hmm. when, they were, when they were doing walkabout. Now, some of the older tales, uh, I say older within the last hundred years, uh, that the um, Aboriginal uh, elders were telling me about, they were on walkabout with some of their young fellows at night, uh, again up toward the, the kangaroos, back up toward the Musgrave and, and uh, McDonald Range. And they were camped for the night without a fire. And one of these craft came flying over and stopped so close to them over a, a set of big rocks that they could sit there and stare at it and see the guys get out, and they were human. And uh, they had a, a stick that they pointed at the rock, and the rock heated up and got you know, you know, fire red, and they did something around there, and then they packed up and got back in their craft and left. So when it was safe to go over, according to, to what I was told, the Aborigines went over and looked at the rock, and of course the rock was still warm, but there were no footprints on the ground. And so <laughs> they put them in the category of the Kadachi foot, you know, feather foot, mm -hmm. um, and kind of, you know, went woo-woo, let's let them be and forget it, you know. Uh, and I think this is you know, it could. I don't know whether it was our guys or not, but uh, in the past, as you can see from the cave drawings over in the northwest, these beings, um, well, they weren't from around here. You know, they 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 were definitely uh, uh, superhuman, and, and their technology was way advanced even what we've got now. And I think those cave uh, drawings do tell that. Oh, I agree with you 100. percent Actually, I have a question for you on that because this is something that has puzzled us for some time, and it's a beautiful segue into, into some other area. It is the, the humanoid or, or, or largely humanoid shape of, of the visitors that we're dealing with. Now, if, if, if you look at um, biological development and things um, happening in a natural way, it's, it's highly unlikely, uh, I think, that we will have uh, the same kind of life form uh, evolve independently or, or, you know, or come about independently from, from uh, in the same way. So having humans on Sirius and humans on the Earth is an unlikely event. Uh, potentially, what, what is your take on having the visitors more largely uh, being of, of humanoid appearance? David, I'm going to answer that question. It'll take a while, but 
you're going to have to understand we're going to have to discuss some uh, biblical issues and uh, ancient documents. Okay. Now, in my considered opinion, after years of studying this and being involved in the project, we have uh, on the planet and have had for thousands of years beings that are human like us, taller, uh, perhaps um, fair skinned, and uh, if you were to have them turn their arm in the sunlight, it would look like a bit of a rainbow effect on their skin from the small scales that are on their, their skin. Uh, some probably reptilian DNA, if you wish. Mm-hmm. This does tie in with some of the um, English translations of the uh, book of Genesis, uh, Beratius in Hebrew, where they talk about the Garden of Eden and, and um, Satan tempting Adam and Eve, and he's cast down on his belly as a reptile, a snake, you know, to crawl around, that kind of stuff. And so mm-hmm. they're also called the Shining Ones, right? So the Shining Ones would refer to those, yeah. I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that could be for two reasons, for the re- reflectivity of their skin tissue and also for the fact that they may have glowed at certain times. And that would been due principally to two things, the energy density on their body. Now, if they poured it through a, at a ground-level port, uh, you know, from a parallel universe, uh, which, you know, is where I'm coming from on this, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. their energy level would be so much higher than ours that um, the ancients would build ziggurats, um, like Tower of Babel type stuff, that had several levels, uh, you know, high above the ground, so that when the uh, ancient ones came through the gateway and were so highly charged, they would have several hours to walk around, eat some fruit or stuff that the locals left on the various levels until their energy dropped to the point where they could touch, uh, you know, down on the ground and touch humans and not kill them with the discharge. Uh, wow. That makes I mean, perfect sense. That, that makes it because in the Bible you're not allowed to look up on uh, anyway. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Look at Moses when he was up on, on yeah. you know uh, uh, he, the mount there. Exactly. Um, mm. He uh, God tells him, look, uh, you know, take your shoes off and and slide your feet toward me. In the Hebrew, it says that so mm-hmm. that you so that you aren't killed in essence. Well, Moses says, look, I've been talking to this burning bush and this voice, and you know, can I see you? And I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, God says to Moses, well, look, Moses, if, if I appear before you and let you see me, uh, you know, face to face, the energy of my presence will destroy your body. And that's mm-hmm. not what I want to do. So I'm going to direct you to a cleft in this mountain, which will shield you. And then I'm going to project my image up on this cloud so you can see the, the shadow of the projection of me up there without looking at me directly. And that will that help? And so, of course, Moses said, yeah. Now, Moses was up there 40 days and nights on the mountain mm-hmm. with God. You know, not only getting the, the Ten Commandments, but getting instruction in a lot of other things. Now, in the Hebrew and in the English, uh, some of the English translations, it talks about uh, Moses coming down from the mountain and and saying to the people, you know, the tribes of Israel that were there, then he says, look, you know, I've got big news for you. And during the weeks that, that, that followed his return to the tribes and settling all the problems they had there, he glowed so much, he was so bright, that he had to put, uh, like, hood over his face and stuff in his hands to keep from frightening the people when he was talking to them because it distracted them. And uh, it was because wherever he was with God, he was being energized. And I suspected what happened was that God made it possible for Moses to enter very close to him. And in the area where God's presence was manifest, the energy density was much greater than here, and so it charged up uh, Moses. Oh, and along that line, uh, you know, most people think, uh, because of the translations they read in English, that the Ten Commandments were, you know, carved into the stone and that was it. When That's not the, the whole case, because when Moses came down with the original set of Ten Commandments before he broke them, he held them up before the men, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the leaders, the senior, you know, tribe heads of the, of, the, of the 12 tribes, and he said, look, you've been making a a golden calf idol, you've broken all the rules, I'm really irritated with you, and I want you to see what you have lost. And so he holds up one tablet in each hand before them and turns them around so that the back was facing them and the front was was at the back. He rolled them around like that, back and forth. And as he did, the letters they could see did not move. They were holographic projections. Hmm. Oh, and okay. and when Moses dropped them down and broke, well, threw them down and broke them, as the rabbinical legend goes, 
the letters that were on the, the surface of the, the tablets danced in the air for a fraction of a second and they disappeared and the stones were smooth. Now, I believe what happened there is that in that 40 days, God gave not only ten, ten Commandments, but all kinds of other information that we needed, you know, medical health and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And we lost that because it was in a, a type of holographic you know, crystalline stone which held just gigazillions of information, right? Mm -hmm. And and we lost it. That's what, what uh, Moses is trying to tell him. So you won't see that in English, but I'm telling you that that incident uh, told us an awful lot about the relationship between our world and God's <coughs> world in the parallel universe. I, Stan, I, I have to ask you a question. Now, um, Only you, one? <laughs> no, there's plenty of let me tell you. Um, you know so much about everything, and I'm, I'm going to focus on in on this for a sec. This is that right. you learned Hebrew so that you could read the original Bible translations, yeah? And, yeah, and, and yeah, that's right. And uh, part part of that, the only question I've got, it's the most pertinent one, is how much differentiation is there between the Hebrew text, not just the terminology and, and the, the way that, uh, you know, they didn't, in their vocabulary, they didn't have those words that we have, you know, later on. So, uh, do you, what is there? What is there? What was so different about the two, and, and what have you learned? Well, let me let me preface it like this: um, If you were to write down, let's say, a, a story now about your community, and you were describe say describe your community and say, "Okay, we've got city hall here, and we've got a red light district over there." Would you know what a red light district is? Yes, we do. Yes. Okay, okay. Now, two thousand years from now, they dig up what you wrote about your community and it, they say what is this red light district Could it, mm. were they using red street lights or what yeah. it's the colloquial meanings that you miss mm -hmm. they, one rabbi estimated that if we were to fully describe the colloquial meanings and detail of the Hebrew in English that the Old Testament would be 35 times as big <laughs> and once I got into it I realized that's true uh, there, it's not an intentional shorting of information to people. It was trying to make it readable and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ad addressable by the common man, enough so to give them what they needed uh, to know about uh, the history of the, of the church and, and of Israel and all that kind of stuff. Scholars, on the other hand, get in there and dig in to the nitty-gritty. And rabbis, you know, and scholars have been doing this for, you know, several thousand years. And as technology increased our knowledge of science uh, increased we were able to go back and retranslate and get even more out of it every time mm -hmm. and, and there are things that we call miracles which were miraculous and would be today even but I I can say from the Hebrew what what how certain things were done technologically by a God that knew all about the terrain where say the uh, the tribes of Israel were traveling and could have Moses or the tribe do something that would produce water or fresh water or food, you know, that kind of stuff. Now we can understand it. It makes it no less miraculous in that time period, but we understand the physics of it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it Absolutely. does. And that's what we come across a lot with ancient legends in the Mahabharat and in the, in the, in the um, Old Testament as well. Just, just a question on, on a specific term, the Yahweh Elohim, right? Uh, yes. This is actually a plural, isn't it? It's, it's referring to a group. It's not a person that refers to. Now, Yahweh Elohim is, is what's used to describe, is the term for God in the Old Testament, correct? Well, it's actually for um, the descendant form of ah. the Elohim. The Yahweh Elohim is the descendant singular person of the Elohim. And the Elohim in Hebrew, uh, they say um, uh Adonai Echad, Adonai, sorry, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad, etc., means they, the oneness, are our one God. Mm -hmm. And in other words, they didn't worship a plurality of gods, they worshiped the oneness. And I suspect, you know, and of course I'll probably be shot by a lot of the churches, but I suspect <laughs> there's more than just the three, you know, Father, Son, Holy Ghost stuff. I think that there was a collection of personalities in the Elohim, still is. Mm -hmm. And but they are the oneness, like the Federation of Planets would be in Star Trek. Yep. Okay, and um, that when a, a form uh, had to be you know put on the Earth for the dominant life form here, Earth uh, humans, they made the the Yahweh Elohim the descendant uh, 
Elohim like descending, not uh, like descended genetically or whatever, but that being became the hybrid being of, of uh, uh, Yeshua, uh, Jesus. Mm-hmm. And he was half human and half being from out there. And that's why there was a virgin birth, you know, technically, because she was inseminated with the 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 gene pool that they needed to produce half human, half God. And mm-hmm. uh, that's why he could do all the neat stuff he could do, because uh, his genetic structure was such that he could have command of the elements here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's, um, that might seem, you know, like, like magic or nonsense to some folks, but it's not. It's simply knowing how to use and access the... Well, the, the 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 model that runs makes this planet run. I mean, uh, I, I think, think we'll be able to do that in time. Yeah, look, I think we're in, 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 in total agreement. Our listeners who've been with us for, you know, for 70-odd shows uh, are with you as well because, I mean, uh, Arthur C. Clarke said any advanced technology, any sufficiently advanced technology will seem like magic to the, to the layman. I mean, today we could ask people, how does a mobile phone work? How does a microwave work in the street? And nobody could answer that, really. You know, we just take That's it as right. given. So I, I know we fully agree with you, and this is this is really the fascinating stuff that we're talking about. It is so, it, it, technology is so advanced that at a molecular or quantum level, even uh, what it may be, um, that that we just still today wouldn't understand it, right? Oh, right. Well, I'll tell you a simple one we can't understand. You remember when the the tribes of Israel being led across the the Red Sea? Or it's actually the Reed Sea, but when they were crossing the Reed Sea, and the waters parted, and they got to the other side. Mm-hmm. And, They'd been traveling maybe two or three days, and they were getting a bit thirsty, run out of water, and they start to complain to Moses, we're, you know, we're drying up here, you know, we're dying of thirst, can you get us some fresh water, because we're right here next to salty water, and that ain't good. So he said, yes. And he said, gather me some of your strong young men here, and I want you, to, uh, I'll send them out to get a particular kind of wood, um, like uh, long pieces of it, okay, like tree trunks. Mm-hmm. So they gathered them and they sharpen them on the ends and whatever. Now he said, get together and hurl those out into the middle of that bitter saltwater pond right there in front of us. And so they did. And surprise, surprise, coming up out of the middle, upwilling, comes fresh, drinkable water right up to the top, and it's good. And they could drink it and, and as much as they wanted, and they survived. How did that happen? Well, today we have uh, military maps, uh, one to 100,000 of that area of the Sinai Peninsula. And right there, where that, the bitter water ponds are, we can find them today. Right up through the bitter water ponds is an underground wadi that goes up into the mountains of the Sinai, where the snow periodically collects, melts, and flows underneath down into the salt water ponds and forms an inversion layer. It's, uh, the fresh water is on the bottom, but it's actually lighter than the salt water on top of it. But because it seeps up from underneath from the snow melt, it doesn't come to the surface until you break the surface tension with, say, logs. And <laughs> the salt water falls in, and it just caves in right there and pushes the fresh water up in its place. I- I've seen it a number of times when I was doing saltwater pools down in Perth. That's well, see, that's... yeah, that is amazing. <laughs> um, see, that, that's another, it's another one of those, you know, uh, we know how to do it. It not, doesn't seem to be magic but it would be magic to someone who doesn't know what it's all about. Hey, I was going to ask you, um, it, sort of tailing off the end of the um, the Bible stories and, and getting maybe into a bit of the, uh, maybe, you know, Nostradamus and some some things that he was saying in to do, you know, um, I've heard you talk about this before and I wanted to, uh, to touch on it, and that's, uh, like the last Pope and the Antichrist, and I know that Nostradamus seems to be telling us that this is near the end, like with a black pope and all that. Can you what 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 have you found in well, your research? Well, I, I think that is what he was meaning uh, is it's near the end of this age because he does go on and tell you that the earth does exist for thousands of years later. I think the biblical term is probably a thousand years. Uh, but whatever, what he was saying uh, was trying to give us information um, on how to recognize the end of this age and you know, hopefully prepare for your part in it. Now, this pope, I think, may be the last pope, uh, the 65th pope. He is a Jesuit, and he, he's not the black pope. Well, not yet, anyway. But uh, he is the pope, and it's almost an oxymoron to call him the Catholic pope coming from the Jesuit order. Now, the Jesuit order, they're 
kind of avowed uh, objective over the ages has been this, to get rid of the Protestant uh, believers who had gone against, you know, the Catholic Church. They, they were a militant group to get rid of them, to kill them or whatever, to convert them. So when you get a guy like that in charge of the Catholic Church who says, well, aliens can be saved and that kind of stuff, it fits in with what uh, Mother Shipton talked about, what Nostradamus mm-hmm. talked about, what the Bible talked about, you know, what um, many, uh, like Edgar Casey, the sleeping prophet, what they were all talking about. And it is the time now that we're living in. Mm-hmm. Well, in my opinion, let's say. This no look and and again we are in one hundred percent agreement with you. Dave and I have have uh, talked about this specific time and it seems like a natural segue before we go into other things. This but we live in a, in a special time I think and and, and I think it's not just a hubris hubris I should say you know, or pride that makes us say this. And um, Dave and I have talked about something called awareness cascade. So we believe. And again, you, you may disagree, of course, <laughs> that, that we're reaching potentially a critical nexus point of, of, of spontaneous, um, uh, spontaneous elevation, if you will, or spontaneous um, uh, um, evolution of the human mind and soul to our true potential. And, and we believe that number uh, of people that is required is about 8 billion. We've, we've uh, looked at the Fibonacci sequence to come up with that. Um, now, um, um, do you think that that is a possibility and that's why they're looking to depopulate once again the planet to make that f- or to stop that from happening potentially well uh, certainly with the misuse that the human uh, that humankind has made of the resources on the planet we do need to reduce the population until we can stabilize our usage of the resources and make it eco-friendly um, i did intercept a, uh, a document on the way to the cia by one of the couriers and he uh, he actually let me do it with, without uh, being obvious about it, but uh, left his uh, chained briefcase to his wrist open and, and, appear, and appeared to be totally drunk so that I could remove this document and read it. And one part of the document, uh, as I've reported in the Cosmic Conspiracy, said that uh, he was taking the report back to Langley, and it said that he, the report recommended that they kill 100 million people in Asia there by withholding grain loans at critical times when the people needed it. And their reasoning was, and, and he had tears in his eyes as he did talk about it later, their reasoning was that um, because the Gandhis had failed in India and were killed for trying to put birth control in place, and because certain religions just would not allow them to practice birth control, um, that they would continue to breed until they would spread out into neighboring nations and destabilize the whole planet eventually in trying to just live and get resources to eat and drink. So I can see... I can see what they're saying, and rather than withhold grain loans that you promise, uh, I might be in favor of saying, well, look, go ahead and let the Indians, the Indonesians, and whatever overpopulate, and they will die, and they will realize that they can't have as many kids because they'll be dying off, can't feed them, or whatever, and maybe the thing will normalize. But I know this isn't going to happen. Uh, the Gandhis proved that. So what we're going to see is massive uh, loss of life, from not only um, environmental uh, catastrophes, but from warfare, uh, and religious and political. And no, I, I, I too have seen the uh, people's research on, and and the historical record showing interviews with these people saying that food is, you know, this is in the seventies even. Food is is our ability to restrict population. So um, I think that's an extraordinary place we come from. In this, um, in, with the warfare and um, that you you mentioned, is this something that we're looking at um, as uh, like a World War Three or something, oh, or is it yeah, going to be separate? Definitely, yep. definitely. We're going to have the beginning of, of what would appear to be World War Three, and it'll a little be put on it pretty quickly by the, the planners that want to have a one-world government. But they have to get the attention of all the peoples of the earth, not the leaders. The leaders do anything you tell them. They're politicians. Mm -hmm. But the people have to say, whoa, stop. We've got nuclear weapons all over the planet. You want war? No, 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 no. We've got to back off of this. No World War III. You know, find another way. And that's when the alternate plan will, you know, alternative three will be offered to the population in a manner that they can easily accept because the alternative is death one way or another. (laughs) Yeah. And Offer, and Offer you can't refuse. Exactly, but the one world government, you know, with one world currency, po- quite possibly, 
as well. Um, it, don't you think we... I think we'd have to be... If they want this population uh, reduction so heavily uh, implemented, they'll have to wait for some time through this no, the, they're, to, they're, as they're, an intervention, wouldn't they? No, no people are going to die. We are going to have the confrontation, and we're going to have viral diseases that are loosed, and, and they will probably be uh, genetically tuned to take out certain gene pool, you know, certain gene structures. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is, you know, not hard to, to visualize or to imagine or to postulate. We know enough publicly about gene modification that this could be done. Um, you know, the virus comes through town, and every fourth person is killed or something because they have, you know, such and such gene structure. Uh, and that will take them out, and it will look like, oh, gosh, an unfortunate um, Spanish flu, um, you know, uprising. Uh, Epidemic, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sad. And that way, you know, people will accept the lie they're given because they don't want to believe the alternative. Uh, you see something very interesting there, um, and Mackie speaking here, sorry. Um, the people don't want to believe it. Have you found that as well? That people just—I mean, you can tell, you can you can bash their head against the truth, and I guess that's why uh, in the Bible it states, you know, by, by the man himself, we live in a, or you live amongst people that have eyes but won't see and have ears but won't hear. People just choose not to hear it or want to believe it, right? It's just easier. You know that is true, and I paraphrase what you're talking about out of the Bible, and I say it this way: there are none so blind as those who will not see. It's the <laughs> mm -hmm. will. See, yep. it's not cannot, but will not see. Yeah. yeah, and there are a lot of those out there, as you pointed out, uh, Mackey. But um, you know, uh, you studied the Illuminati and New World Order and that kind of stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. When I first started talking about that back in seven, <coughs> seven even that was a year before I even wrote my book, uh, it was a pretty novel idea, and people were going, "Oh, really?" <laughs> uh, in in Australia, and uh, I found that once I started explaining it that a huge, huge percentage of the Australian public started saying, yes, I understand. Mm -hmm. Now, more so than in the States, they banned my book here for some time, and it, it, I'm just now getting the American population up to where you guys were in uh, 1980, 82, in that region. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't know why that happened that way, but it did. Anyway, the Illuminati, everybody thinks, okay, they're the bad dudes, and I agree. They are bankers, they are industrialists, they are, you know, one world uh, planners that think that they know better than we do and that we're going to be the serfs and they're going to be, you know, the landholders and, the, mm. the, you know, the kings and squires and whatever. Now, they're going to get a big surprise because in any takeover of a country, or, you know, or, or a tribe or whatever by another tribe, if you want to do it properly, you get in there with your your feet on the ground with spies, you know, uh, secret guys that go in and pretend to be a member of the, the tribe or the city or the, you know, the country you're going to take over and to feed you intel back saying, okay, you can hit them here, you can do it that way, and this, that'll help you to destroy the country. Now, usually what they do is they recruit people from that country so they have the same language, they have the same cultural bias, they've been there, everybody knows them, but they put pressure on them or give them goodies, and those people become spies for the attacking army. Well, that's fine. So the Illuminati are our spot, are the spies of those that are going to take over the earth of Satan, if you wish. Yes. What Sorry. Go ever, on. <laughs> okay. Now, what happens is this: historically, the invading army, first thing it does, first thing once it comes into a country that it's done that to, is it grabs up all of its spies, the traitors, mm -hmm. and kills them. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because you can't trust them. They mm -hmm. might turn on you. So the Illuminati and the bankers and stuff, they're in deep, deep do right now. I'll tell you, they don't realize they're going to go. Exactly right. See, we, we looked at it the same way as you did, right? They're the, they're, if this were a prison, they would be the trustees, right? They would be the guys that in the know, they get all the perks, if you will. But once the regime change comes along, the first thing you do is exactly that. You, you get rid of anybody who, who, who can't be trusted and who could potentially stage a coup against you as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We agree. And... You know, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that of your own free will there because, you know, uh, it means we're both getting fed information by the same spirit, you know, the same knowledge source. And yeah. and, and that's, that's a good sign. Mm, I agree. Yeah, I'm actually astonished. that uh, I just keep nodding over here. You can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> we're both doing it, let me tell you that. 
But as you keep talking about different things, and, and we've covered already in, in just a very short time a, a vast range of topics with in-depth knowledge that is just amazing on your side. And I just keep nodding to myself, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and Dave and I, like I said, we've done 70-odd shows, and we've, we've touched on these things. And the knowledge that you have goes much deeper, of course, than ours. And But we are in agreement, I think, on, on most things. It's astonishing. And you're right. It, it, be, coming from very different places ourselves, we usually also ask our guests, uh, for example, yourself, Stan, how you got into this. Now, normally we do it at the beginning, but we got right into it. So if I could ask you how your journey started here uh, and, and got you to, to today. Well, I'll, I'll shorten the tale a bit because that allows us to talk about a few other things as well. But <laughs> when I was back in the States in 1971, I was, I was born in Texas and raised there. And... Uh, I had a job in the computer industry. I was trained by IBM in Dallas uh, for using large computers and to help companies solve their problems that, that had the IBM computers. Now, uh, when I was working on this in Dallas, I was approached by uh, Dr. James R. Maxfield, a radiation research uh, medical doctor, actually, but he used in radiation research. And he was part of a, of a team uh, headed up by Dr. Edward Teller, the inventor or the father of the hydrogen bomb. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Dr. Maxfield sent for me, and I went over to meet him there in Dallas in his office, and in the meeting he explained that he and Dr. Teller and, and uh, the equivalent of Dr. Teller in Russia, Dr. Andrei Sakharov, and their equivalent in other countries, had been for some time since the, I guess it was oh, probably the early 50s, they had been for some time in a joint R&D project with aliens <laughs> um, across the planet to develop technologies and in return to give the uh, quote-unquote aliens access to our human gene pool for research as long as they didn't hurt anybody. Well, of course, that didn't go well from the start, but anyway, they wanted me to join their project. They already had anti-gravity in 71. They already had it before that, and I was going to file a patent on a plasma dynamic craft, which is not truly anti-gravity, it's just a, a plasma, charged plasma air flow over a saucer or disc-shaped object. And they got wind of it early, and before he even filed the patent, uh, I suspect it happened when they broke into my home, uh, somebody did uh, right before all this happened, and looked into my lab and found out what I was doing. Anyway, they said, look, uh, you know, hey, how would you like to join us? You know, we've got bases here and there and under the South Pole at uh, New Schwabenland and, you know, mm -hmm. come on down to Australia and work with us. And I said, well, okay, are you all in Australia? Oh, no, 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 we've got bases in Norway, we've got them in Canada and, uh, you know, mainland Australia, you know, underground and under the sea in some places and in West Germany and parts of it over in East Germany, some of the old tunnels that, that the Nazis left. And even in Russia, we've got some stuff going there and... Uh, they went on to name all these things and in New Zealand, and I thought, holy cow, how do you get along with these guys, you know, the, the enemy? Uh, he says, well, it, the enemy's at a political level. He said, uh, we are actually in the scientific community uh, of one accord here in developing uh, these new technologies for energy, uh, you know, uh, non-polluting, limitless energy and transport, anti-gravity, uh, new medicine. And in return, we have to give these guys, you know, a little bit of uh, testing on our own people, which in the end will be for our own good, you see. And so they they paid me and set me up and took my whole family down to Australia. And uh, I immigrated down there, and they set me up as an Australian citizen, etc., and, uh, and an American, you know, dual citizenship. And my uh, control agent down there was Captain Sir John Williams in Melbourne of the Adelaide Steamship uh, you know, the company. Mm -hmm. um, he... Um, he was quite a fellow, actually. He was a tall statesman-like guy. He looked like he'd be a good uh, uh, full-rigger, you know, sailing captain. He was he had good uh, bearing. But anyway, when I arrived down and reported into him, I, I was shown. He just pulled it out of a, a little pocket in the end of the Mercedes we were in, and we were being driven by a chauffeur. And because uh, I was telling him, you know, that you know what my contact details were once we made it where I was, where I'd gotten a home to stay and stuff. And he says, "Oh boy," he says, "You don't understand." And he pulls out about an inch thick uh, portfolio and says, this is you, and we know all about you, so don't hmm. worry. And uh, so time passed, and uh, I wrote papers for him and for, and for um, oh, uh, let's see, it was uh, Sir John and Sir Henry Somerset, who was one of the nine chancellors of the CSIRO at the time. And uh, I had to rewrite the paper a couple times because he didn't like my discussion on the alien presence thing and what that might mean 
and certainly didn't like me detailing some of the technology, uh, you know. And uh, so I said, well, okay, guys, we're starting to disagree on a number of things. And um, Oh, and let me back up. In my first introduction down at uh, Aeronautic Research Labs, uh, the AR ARL down at Fisherman's Bend, it, it's now under a different name. I forget what, you, what they call it now, but CSI has been replaced by that. And so when I was in the meeting with uh, Dr. Tom Keeble and three maybe four of his physicists, all were cleared with top security, a top secret down there. They were asking me details about how I'd come to Australia, who I'd seen along the way, did ASIO in, in, in interrogate me and stuff like that. And I said, no, I'd, as far as I know, I've never met anybody from ASIO. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> and they said, oh, that's good. And uh, they said, you know, we've got uh, quite a video library at uh, an RAF uh, base here that has... Uh, you know, UFOs flying on it. We've collected quite a bit of that stuff. And I said, oh, could I see it? And they all, including Dr. Cable, said, oh, no, no. But at the same time, they were miming and pointing with their fingers at the bookcase in the room. And they said <laughs> they were miming maybe, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, they were being monitored. So it wasn't long after that, actually, just a few years, and, and Dr. Cable uh, was replaced, uh, taken out of his chair. And when he did die, they opened up his papers, and there was a cartoon in the desk there that was of him. Someone had drawn a cartoon showing him with wings like Icarus, too close to the sun. And the statement mm. was, you know, Tom flew too close to the sun, and you know, wow. he, he, and he was taken out of action. But, um, yeah, it was, you know, I, I forget who the deputy prime minister was at the time, but uh, I had to call him one night for the group and uh, tell him to be at a meeting with Dutch Shell Oil. I got him out of the shower and told him such and such. He said that you should be at the meeting. He said, yes, sir, I will do that. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> this guy doesn't even know me. I just mentioned the name and tell him he's got to be there. And he says, okay, how high do I jump? You know. Oh, wow. So um, these guys, I mean, we met at the Melbourne Club for lunch and stuff like that. You know, that that bastion of, of, of Liberal Party stuff there in, in Victoria, in fact, for the country. And I saw that the country was run kind of like the United States, you know, the cigars and cotton tops in the back room with port. They're the ones that make it all happen. Mm -hmm. And these guys, coincidentally, were in charge of at least, uh, you know, the branch that I was assigned to of this international development group to, to develop all these technologies. Now, I left the group in 74. I was only there a couple of years, and we had a parting of the ways because I... I wanted to release some of the, the free energy stuff we had and possibly some of the electrogravitics or anti-gravity in, in countries that needed fresh water just to, to grow crops and survive and to take care of themselves. And they told me at the time, boy, you just don't understand what this is all about. And I said, well, you're right. And uh, I had learned in some of the earlier discussions with uh, Sir John that they didn't like Jews. And apparently in that inch thick folder, they didn't find the fact that my father was Jewish. So... You know, we were coming to a party of the ways over a number of issues rather rapidly. And one day they chopped off my files, uh, destroyed them, and uh, let me know they were gone and gave me what was left that they didn't destroy on my front porch. And they said, we are no longer connected. We have nothing to do with you and do not contact us. You know, you're finished. So I thought, right, okay. Word came back rather, rather quickly that um, I was going to be at the bottom of a mine shaft in huh. Ballarat somewhere, Jeez. Mm -hmm. permanently, and that's when I, you know, I'd, by that time I'd already started to grow a beard and, uh, you know, find uh, work in a Mexican restaurant there with Taco Bill and uh, made good friends with him, and uh, anyway, when I had to run, I had, I had met a, a hippie couple, uh, uh, you know, a young couple, and they had a van that was all painted up in the typical hippie stuff of the day, and I had a, a, a an old... Um, Holden that I was driving around then. I'd sold everything else, and I knew things were getting tense, and I was going to go down soon, so I planned an escape uh, that started at midnight one night all of a sudden, and the hippie couple went ahead of me over to Adelaide, and I drove all night to meet them without telling anybody anything and just leaving some keys and instruction with a friend of mine there to execute after I left town that night. Went across the Nullarbor eventually, and I spent a few months there in, uh, in Adelaide, and you know, try to figure out what I was going to do and hit out with some people that no one knew that I knew. And eventually crossed the Nullarbor, went to Perth, had the backing and support of the local ASIO branch and, uh, the, you know, the local police and the military at the SAS barracks there. And both of them signed a, a bodyguard to me at times when I was out in the public. 
you know, 45 automatic toting bodyguards and mm-hmm. karate, karate chopping guys. In fact, the one that they used to guard the Prime Minister of Japan when he was down there was my, my bodyguard there in Perth for many years. Wow. Um, oh, look, you guys are too young to have lived through all this, but in the heyday of all this back in the um, early 80s and the late <coughs> 70s, um, Belky Peterson invited me over to speak in, in his uh, state in Queensland. He had a, a private meeting with me and his pilot uh, uh, with Beryl. And um, he, he wanted to know about the Illuminati, what I knew, and we exchanged uh, things. And he assigned a bodyguard team to me. They, they wore kind of dark tan leather coats and you know, loosely uh, dressed up a bit. But I did a lecture there in the Cooperu High School over a weekend, you know, several uh, hours a day. And there was a, a heckler on the second day right up in the front row, maybe two rows back, I guess. And he was jumping up in the middle of my lecture, which was biblically based, and it was before I'd even written The Cosmic Conspiracy. And he was saying, you know, you know, blah, 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 I think you're full of this and that. And I didn't know what to say to him. I'd never faced a heckler before. And I noticed two of the, the uh, Peterson bodyguard detail came slowly walking down one to each end of the row the guy was in and they excused himself and and kind of moved in sideways sidestepping to get to him and one of them leaned over to him as he was mouthing off and whispered his, in his ear and the guy straightened out like somebody gave him an electric shock and said hmm and he started moving out with him as they moved out of the aisle and back to the room and never saw him again you know <laughs> uh, so I was I was thankful I had the protection of, of old Joe I I really liked him he was quite a character but, He's, uh, he certainly I, was at that. Yeah, he was. And uh, I think in those days he would have made a good prime minister, but there was no chance of that happening with the way the voting was going. Um, and in Teller's group, they were friends, uh, close friends, with um, Lang Hancock. In fact, Lang uh, flew uh, Dr. Teller all around Australia for Teller's birthday one year. And they did approach me after I resurfaced over in uh, Perth, after I'd been there a couple of years, and they said, look, and this is before, again, before I wrote the book, they said, look, if you'll just be quiet and not say any more, we'll set you up with research facilities and whatever here in West Australia. Do you need engineers? Do you need facilities? What do you need? Just name it, and we'll do it, but be quiet. And that if you do it and behave, you can have leadership, if not total uh, running, of this country when we set up the, the global government. Wow. And this is in a meeting in, I think it was the Paddington Hotel or something like that, down in the restaurant. They cleared everybody out of the restaurant, customers and everybody, in the middle of the day, put guards around me and, and Hancock's and Wright's um, attorneys, and they made this proposition to me. And I said, well, guys, you don't have to wait for the answer. I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to do that. I am going to tell people what they need to know. And that's what started you know, my whole uh, march toward revealing the truth over the years. That's incredible, but but also some of the things you were talking about uh, shows that um, for, first of all these groupings aren't all powerful. Number one, and number two, there seem to be some fragmentation as well, right? Oh, there is. Uh, you'll have you know disagreements between groups in any tribe. The one tribe, the one country that really is not joining this is China. Mm. Uh, China is uh, you, you know using Sun Tzu art of war. They are holding back and let all the other guys fight, and then they're going to march in and pick up the pieces. Mm-hmm. That's Actually, been that's what I'm following at the moment. Well, Genghis Khan used it. I mean, it's it works. It really does. Hmm. Do you know what we're we're coming up to the the break, and I I I'm glad that we uh, we got through that. It's awesome. Mm. I I just you know we I think I even have more more questions for you. I've been writing down so many questions while you've been talking. <laughs> My goodness. Well, we can catch up on those another show if we run out of time. <laughs> yeah, if we do. But you know what? We're going to come back after the break. And um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you some more about some of that technology. You know, it's been amazing to hear from from a local perspective. Mickey, you can agree with me on this one. Mm. Some of these names that you're bringing up, uh, and you know, I had always thought that the CSIRO were involved. Didn't know how um, at all. Didn't know what they knew, and uh, that's some. Um, some amazing information there and, and Joe you know what that's probably why they you know they took him down oh absolutely he, look he knew what you and I are talking about now he knew back then you know wow I mean, um, we went in a room down in the basement there of government house there and uh, he and Beryl and I and you know 
I I just I can't tell you how much respect I have for the man or I had for the man. He's gone now, but mm-hmm. what what a guy. See, yeah, we, yeah. We talk about the puppet show that the people believe is actually the truth. What you see in the news, you know, blah blah blah. But the actual truth is is quite more, quite a bit more complex. And and people are not as simple as they appear, and they have more knowledge than than they're given credit for. So, it, having this information coming from you, who had first track, first hand uh, contact and and um, insight into these people and events, uh, really puts it in perspective for our listeners. I think because it is never as simple as it appears, guys. TV is really just entertainment, <laughs> okay? Well, it is. And, you know, it's not your fault that you don't know these things, and you can understand that from what it's all about. But um, I, I guess what we're talking to is your listeners are a different generation than the, your fathers and grandfathers that I talked to there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but i got to tell you, when, when this was hot and active, we had uh, John Schusler from uh, McDonnell Douglas, uh, the, the director of space flight operations for the shuttle, come down. We did lecture and tour across Australia. We had airline pilots telling us secrets about how they were told not to report, uh, you know, this and that in the sightings. And, I mean, the country was alight with this kind of discussion. It, uh, Australia was just on fire with it. And there were churches supporting it. And, and I, in one year alone, I lectured to 100 different churches in one year. Wow. They wanted to know. And, and, and if they had to done that and had to made it such a, you know, um, a, a, an exciting time. I might not have, you know, written the book and done all the things I did, but with their support, I was able to do it. Uh, with with a guy named George Spall over in uh, in Brisbane, he Christian fellow had a Christian bookshop, and he said, "Write the book, and we'll pay for the first printing." And we did, and it sold out in a week. So, three years in a row, I was in the I was in the top ten uh, books published in Australia. Wow! Yeah. And you know oh. what? I published it because the, the, the people we hired to do it, uh, Ghostwrite it and everything else in Melbourne, threw up their hands after three editors said it's too hard. So I wrote it myself. And I printed <laughs> it myself. Do you know how oh. many copies? We've sold a quarter of a million copies of that at least now in English. And I don't know how many in French and, and German. Well, you know, we're going to have the links to all of this stuff in our show notes and um, we'll be posting it. Um, it should be in the chat room any second. Thank you. Um, let's hold on, everyone. Um, here we're coming up to the. We are at the break now, and we'll see you sh- after a short intermission. Don't go away. Hang five. <laughs> we're back with Stan, our special guest today, Stan Deo. Um, thanks, everyone, for holding on for the break. Um, Stan, I, I've got to ask, and it's burning me since you were talking about this. And that is uh, anti-gravity. Now, I, I, I once saw on the Discovery Channel an interview with a general who, who was showing they were buying some helicopter thing and they were signing off on the contract and it was awesome, this brand new helicopter. And he said, this is the last helicopter we'll buy, he said. And then he continued to say, the next thing is anti-gravity. And I thought it was interesting they left it in. They could have cut it there and never told us about it. But what... Now, you, you worked with this, yeah? Oh, yeah. You look, um, you know, I was on the periphery of it. I was developing my systems and, and things that went with the alternate energy. But I did... Uh, they did show me photos of the assembly area and, uh, and some brief, very brief uh, discussion because you're very compartmentalized and you're not allowed to really talk about, you know, between departments. So I had to you know, probe security guards and various other people to get more information in. And, you know, I realized that years before I'd even joined the project that the the basis for the anti-gravity device had been developed by um, a navigator on a strategic air command bomber that a friend of mine used to be the pilot of. And he had told me about it, you know, probably 1970. And uh, I didn't realize at the time that that's what they'd done for real. You know, the, the, the navigator was transferred out two weeks later and disappeared, but that tells you something right there. And, yes, I can I can discuss that, um, uh, not to the point of uh, actually being able to build a circuit. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate uh, with the terrorist uh, loose out there. Of but, course. Uh, I can give you enough of a discussion that you can understand, you know, how it works. Mm-hmm. In fact, I'm preparing a paper I've been working on two years uh, because it's going to be a PDF file with um, animations in it that I'm, I'm rendering here to show people 
uh, how it works, visually how gravity works, and why it has different shapes, if you wish, at galactic level versus uh, atomic level. Anyway, what's your question now? Well, my question is, when Mickey and I, we used to work together, and you know, all those years ago, Mickey, my That's goodness, right. it's like, what, how, what now, 15? Well, close enough. <laughs> yeah, well, nearly 20 years, right? Um, one of those things is, I, I almost had a complete understanding of, of how uh, anti-gravity would work, by shielding yourself from gravity everywhere and then opening up, say, uh, a portal in the direction you wanted to go and grabbing onto that space and time there and pulling yourself towards it, then while it was tense, letting go where you are. Hmm. And that would make you dart, seemingly dart over there when really you are already at the destination. It's not quite that way, but Mm -hmm. it's close. Uh, You... The explanation kind of works, unless you want to get down to the details of it. But um, with a gravitic field, you do uh, you make what's uh, best described as a flying flux capacitor. And, I, and I'm not being you know flippant by saying that uh, you know back to the future flux capacitor type stuff. But mm-hmm. uh, a normal capacitor in physics and electronics is described as something that holds some static charges. They aren't moving. It's just a Q number of charges. Now, if you then develop the equation to say Q over T, or moving charges, then you have a dynamic circuit, which is not static, and the electrons in that are moving. Well, that's a flux capacitor. Now, Michael Faraday could never figure out how to do that, and there's a trick to it. You have to be able to stack up moving electrons in a circuit, passing them from one layer to the next, back, 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 and forth like that, and build up a huge field over a period of a few minutes or you know longer if you've got a smaller motor. But you can take a Volkswagen engine, connect it to a generator, and make pulse DC into the, the, the two coils that are prime uh, movers in it, and you can stack up a field over you know, 20, 30 minutes that will lift up a 30-ton craft. Wow. But it's, it's dynamic. It is staying in and through and around the craft and the crew. Then all you have to do, as you pointed out, is open up a, a, a lower pressure area, if you wish, mm-hmm. on some part of the surface of the field, and you'll 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 be pushed into that at a rapid speed. And you can either go vertically, you can go horizontally, but you will have to um, slow down to make turns, or increase the energy density in the field so that when you turn the corner quickly, it really stretches time out for the occupants so they don't have the g-forces all at once. They amortize them over. You know, 100 times the amount of time it takes, and then discharge the extra energy as a flash, and keep on going in the new vector. That's why they don't like to make, you know, at high speed they don't like to make gradual turns. They like to make sharp stop, start, and go in the new vector. Which is exactly what we're observing, right? I assume so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what we've observed as well. You know, the unusual. If you if you classify them as an unusual flight characteristics. Mm. Um, can I also yes. ask, uh, the technology you just described uh, sounds to me like a, a potentially a stacking of fields. I, is that at all related to the Nazi bell technology? I'm not sure. I think the bell technology, they were experimenting more with uh, uh, mercury in, in uh, liquid dynamic motion. Yep. Um, it could probably generate similar effects depending upon how they spun the um the uh, the fluid the, the the mercury in two directions at once. Um, part of the secret, and, and obviously I'm not going to detail all of it, but part of the mm. secret is you have say around a, a donut shaped thing. Have you seen my uh, my picture of that on the internet somewhere? Yes, you know, uh, I have too. Okay, yes. there's a flat coil, one layer coil wrapped around that donut, which is um, a, a moon metal or a very um, a very inductive core that's hollow, square section coil. Now, on the inside or the outside of that coil, you know, in the core of it or the outside, you can wrap another coil, same kind of material, you know, flat uh, bar, and you wind that so that it has the same uh, impedance to the current running through it that mm-hmm. the coil wrapped around the donut does. Now, in one of the illustrations I have on the internet, I show the navigator's test that he did uh, back in the 50s to make anti-gravity. He, he stumbled on it, and what he'd done was he'd taken a simple uh, washer, iron washer, soft iron washer, 
cut it so that it had the you know the breathing space for the magnetic field. And he cut a hole in it. Mm-hmm. He wrapped a coil around that, just like you see in, of the flat coil I've, I've told you about online. And then he took an iron rod that would fit down in the hole of that uh, iron washer, and he wrapped a standard coil around that and put the iron rod through the split washer. Mm-hmm. Then those two coils were connected in a manner that he could pulse direct current into them, into one of them, say the, the washer coil, release the, the, the pulse going in, and direct the back EMF into the the vertical or, or bar, or sorry, or you know, like the, the bar coil. To alternate. To, well, and at the same time you're putting it into the bar coil, you pulse it with the in phase with another DC pulse, which adds, now you've got 2Q in motion. And then you take that 2Q and back EMF back to the original donut coil and add another Q, and you've got 3Q in motion going back and forth. And the reason that these big craft, at least the 30-foot diamonds, use flat bar is because the flat bar uh, offers much less resistance to the current flow and heats up a lot slower than a, a round wire would. Hmm. It's just, you know, standard electronics. But um, when you stack the field up and uh, like that back and forth, back and forth, like the navigator did, uh, depending upon how you structure the field, uh, when you try to move the object, if you don't have the moving, the impressed fields on it to cause that directional change you're talking about, you can cause the whole field to collapse on itself and all the energy to convert to one massive kind of ball lightning meltdown of crew and everything. It leaves a tidy hole where they used to be. Oh, wow. Uh, in the assembly areas, they, they had flat field coils for navigation laid out uh, you know, besides, outside the donut. And they were marked with big pieces of paper typed in there with the letters A and B, showing you which way those coils had to be wrapped around uh, the, the main uh, gravitic coils. Mm-hmm. Because if you reverse the polarity on them, the first time the crew got up there and tried to push the go button, they disappeared. I mean, oh. So it's did, a very important issue. Um, did, does, that, does that lend uh, itself maybe to the Philadelphia experiment? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, in fact... I've got some of the circuits from the Navy for the um, um, the type of, of craft the Eldridge was. It was a, um, a mine detector, magnetic mine detector. And, um, excuse me, <coughs> they have um, three coils, three axis coils, which there's one set of coils that's wound so that it's um, it's like the donut sitting on the ocean. Mm-hmm. They have another set that's around the uh, aft, uh, you know, to the bow to aft uh, axis of the of the uh, craft, mm-hmm. and then another one at midsection is going around. And by balancing the direct current, which wasn't pulsed, it was the direct current on those with three different um, uh, generators in the bottom of the of the craft. They could make their magnetic signature look like wherever they were on the Earth in the ocean, look like they should be there because normally, you know. Uh, metal ships passing through the ocean distort the magnetic field. Mm-hmm. So what the guy below decks would do was compensate by dialing these things, knowing what the, the, the map of the region says for the magnetic field strength and, you know, the vector toward the earth and toward the poles and that kind of stuff. Now, that kind of a craft was excellent for the Philadelphia experiment. And why is this? They had the three axis coils there, even though they were using them a different way. They also had the DC generators there to pulse the fields. All the Philadelphia experiment guys had to do was to figure out a way to not only pulse the DC, but catch the vacuum up and transfer it to the next coil, next coil, etc., like that. Now, they weren't trying to make anti-gravity. They were really trying to bend electromagnetic radiation like radar, which, by the way, is just a different frequency like light is. Mm-hmm. But they were trying to bend radar so that the radar would hit them Instead of bouncing back to receiver, it would bend around and keep on going, bend around the field and gone. Now, I've I've talked to um, uh, you know and, and exchanged letters with uh, Townsend Brown, who worked on the project, um, and uh, he wasn't a major player in it, but he did work on the project. And uh, I have gotten explanations of what happened and why it happened, and have even uh, been asked to present my uh, findings to a member of the. Uh, United Kingdom's nuclear uh, energy panel, which I did do, hmm. and uh, they confirmed that what I told them was correct. Now, here's what happened. They started charging up the field around the Eldridge, and the observers and the, the attendant uh, craft that were watching them from a distance 
nothing happened for a while. And then all of a sudden there was this, well, all of a sudden, it started to happen as a, a, um, a glow started to appear, a greenish glow around mm-hmm. the entire craft. Yeah, we've mm-hmm. heard that. Yep. Okay, and then pretty soon the craft disappeared and there was a depression in the ocean where it used to be, and then there was no depression and no craft for a couple of minutes. Now, at that same time, within a minute, back at their dock, you know, probably 200 miles away mm-hmm. at Norfolk, the guard standing duty on the docks there saw their birth, green cloud appears, and it diminishes. As it's diminishing, he starts to see the crew running around on the deck like ants in a big hurry. All of a sudden, the, the green glow starts to come back again, and the elders disappears. A minute later, it appears 200 miles away, back at the test area. Now, what had happened was that on board the craft, the crew, you know, fired up the field. At first, there was nothing. Then it started to be kind of pearly white around them, and uh, you know, not totally so, but it started to glow. And uh, looking over the side, they could see that the waves that the bow was making as they were moving would only go out so far, and then the sea seemed to be still or frozen. And what? was happening is time for them the the physical chemical reactions had accelerated because their energy density was being pumped up in all their molecules and so they could move through the water in this bubble of this field all the way back to Norfolk and back in the space of a you know two minutes of a minute each way when they started to turn the field off guys started to burn guys started to to be totally frozen in motion some guys were stuck into the metal deck Mm mm-hmm all this kind of stuff you read about happened as the field started to, to close down. They melded their atoms with, you know, the ship. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So they quickly turned the field back on to stop that effect and chug back out to where they belong. And in reverse, they, they reappeared to uh, the attendant uh, squadron out there and, and they, or, you know, the attendant vessels, and they came in and uh, cleaned up the mess. Now, the Philadelphia experiment did happen. And as I say, it was not meant to, to, to prove anti-gravity. It was meant to bend radar, to bend radar, but it actually bent a much wider spectrum of electromagnetic waves, including visible light. And that's what that's what the Philadelphia experiment was about. And that uh, being right after, you know, right around the, the end of World War II, there um, was a precursor to anti-gravity, which we traded off with the alleged aliens to get the, the, the working version. Huh, Janet, you know, that that leads me directly to my next question, and and that is to do it's, it's to combine question here. It's like a, a are aliens here? And because I hope it's real, you know, because I've got a a book out myself about my own induction experiences. Um, but I and I was hoping that it weren't just my labs doing it, and it, that the aliens are real. But how how closely uh, do you think? that aliens in our governments, and not just the U.S. government, but all of the governments, from what I've already heard so far, are working with, and maybe back engineering. Did we discover this on our own? Can you tell me some more the, about that? Some of the stuff we were, we were getting to uh, ourselves, mm-hmm. uh, but we're not quite to the sophistication that obviously beings that have had it for thousands of years could, uh, could give us. Now, the, in the late 70s, our worldwide organization that the Tellers Group were, you know, we were a member of, came under attack by the alleged aliens on our basis that we had built for them, underground, under ocean, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And they, they started fighting with us and kicking us out. Now, you know, uh, I was warned about this by Sir John even before I left. And it, it, as I say, in the late 70s, they started systematically kicking us out of our bases. Their techno- technological knowledge was so far ahead of us that the reason they were even inviting us to be a joint venturing and build the infrastructure we did underground was this. Where they came from, they were cast out like a parallel universe. They were cast into our world in anticipation of a battle that they're going to have with, in the biblical terms of Jesus. So they didn't have all the technology they needed here, and they needed to build new weapons and technology for the big battle they're going to have with him. So they had to use earth people and help them uh, to help them build infrastructure here that they could then enhanced after they kicked the humans out to make the advanced weapons. That's why we were kicked out and no longer needed because we had served our purpose. Mm -hmm. Now this is Satan's group. You know, in biblical terms, this is Satan's group. And the great critters we're talking about were basically biological robots or cyborgs that he created 
to do his his uh, his bidding, and they were like um, soulless uh, automatons, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's why so many abductees uh, have said they did. They just looked at me with hollow eyes, and they they didn't seem to have any emotion. That's, that's right. They, they didn't have any. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm sure you experienced that yourself. Completely. Now, okay, those cre- those creatures have been around and been doing Satan's bidding and are serving a multi-fold purpose. Since the uh, abduction started in the, uh, in the 50s and, and got worse as time progressed, people have become frightened of this. I don't want to be abducted by those eight, you know, gray alien critters. Uh, they might hurt me. I mean, you know, no, no, I'm frightened of them. And uh, if they exist, you know. Now, in essence, Satan has created an enemy for humankind to fear. Now, Satan and his uh, buddies, the, the ones that are, are kicked out of the universe where they used to live, they are like us, taller, handsomer, you know, healthier, and all that kind of stuff. But they, they do have a soul and emotion. So they're going to appear on the scene when full disclosure is made in the near, 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 near future. And they're going to say, hey, we're here to help you. We'll get rid of these great critters there from mm-hmm. Center Reticuli and, you know, all this kind of stuff. We're, we're going to get rid of them. They, they shouldn't have been doing what they're doing. And sorry it went this far, but we're here to help you. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and... Oh, by the way, we're going to get rid of those Illuminati guys that have been giving you all the trouble. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And we're going to get rid of cancer. We're going to give you all kinds of... It's just a replay, for real, of the Series V. You remember V? Yes, 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 yes. yes. That, that series that Kenneth Johnson wrote is absolutely spot on. I don't think they'll be wearing, you know, lizard suits under their, their, their face or something, but mm-hmm. they do have, you know, probably reptilian DNA in it from what the old records say. Um, but that... There are no aliens, per se, in my opinion, that are in this battle here. There may be life forms all through the universe that have different forms, fine. But for what is happening here on the Earth, in this uh, virtual courtroom where, where the judgment's going to be made and where the battle's going to be fought between Jesus and Satan, here, what we're seeing here is manufactured you know, biological entities that are just r- robotic, and they are made to be the enemy of mankind and probably be painted as what we would call Satan, while Satan himself poses as a messenger of light, you know, Hmm. love, truth, and harmony, and all that kind of stuff. And people will buy it because the alternative is just too horrible to contemplate. Mm -hmm. So so the two questions naturally arise out of this. Number one, and and I'm going to talk about the uh, basis later. Number one, because you you made a very clear point about soon, 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 uh, there will be a revelation. So I'm curious to uh, ask you um, how soon, and number two, what is the end game then? What what is the purpose of all of this? Because I mean that's that's really what what's itching us, you know? Like it's like a splinter in our minds. What is it all about? So first of all, how soon do you think this this uh, revelation or uh, disclosure will be made? I'd say we're within weeks to months, probably wow. between now between now and April of next year. And the reason I say this is because uh, data we're getting in from secular sources about uh, Netanyahu's. Uh, options with Iran at the moment is that he has to make a decision on a strike or preemptive strike in the next two to three weeks and uh, because the clock's running on what Iran is producing in their uh, centrifuges. Also, the terrorists have got uh, mass destruction weapons, you know, bioweapons in Damascus. Uh, the, the Israelis have already bombed some of the outskirt deposits of it around Damascus, but there's a bigger amount of it in Damascus, we're pretty sure. And they got these from uh, Saddam when he shoves, shoves up across the border. Now, there's also some reason to think, uh, I had a friend on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that was telling me when they investigated Saddam, they couldn't find it, but they were reasonably certain that he had at least one nuke, maybe more. Now, probably a Russian thing. Anyway, that might be in Damascus now. And so whether Netanyahu, you know, whether Israel makes a preemptive strike on Damascus, or whether Damascus gets bombed by itself because the terrorists get a hold of a bomb and set it off by accident or whatever, or intentionally. doesn't matter whether Israel does or not. Israel is going to be blamed for it. As a result, the world is going to be taken to the brink of World War III nuclear annihilation. And that's later this year. You know, you know, four or five weeks, uh, two months, something like that. Now, wow. j- just keep an eye on Israel. Watch, watch what happens there. As soon as the, as the conflict starts over there, know that we're measuring the time in weeks when Russia is then going to retaliate with its uh, mutual defense pact with uh, Iraq and with Syria and you know they'll move into the, the Lebanon and into the Golan Heights 
and they'll put troops on the ground in northern Israel. The Bible says that that invading troop, the invading troops of Gog Magog, will die on the mountains of Israel. They will all just die. And Israel will spend seven months, not a year, seven months, putting special burial teams out to mark the dead bodies so that the burial teams that are protected, obviously, can go out there and bury these contaminated bodies, whether they're radiated or whether they're, um, I think it's going to be a bioweapon of some sort that will be contagious. So they then spend seven months getting rid of all the dead bodies. Then they spend seven years burning all the weapons uh, that the, the soldiers left behind. Now, they're not going to, Israel's not going to burn the weapons when the Messiah is here. He will supply them with the fuel or the energy they need to light their homes and to warm themselves and to grow crops and whatever. So this is going to be at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period spoken of. That's, that, that tells you it will at that time the tribulation period is starting. And at that time, as, as well, the Antichrist will be revealed. This situation is going to, re, uh, going to frighten people so much that they will require someone to solve the problem and avoid the war. This is where Satan then flies in and says, oh, look, guys, uh, I see you're in trouble. And, you know, we have the technology to help you and to get rid of these critters to stop the war, bring peace and protect you against the asteroid impact and all this kind of stuff, for free energy, got all that. Now, we can back off and let you guys, you know, fight each other and, and kill yourselves, or, hey, we can step down there and, and unify you like we're unified into, you know, one happy federation out here, and uh, we'll appoint one of your humans to be in charge of it, obviously the Antichrist, and, uh, you know, we'll make it all happen. Uh, just, you know, let us know. Uh, we're here. Here's our address, you know. And it won't be like the Independence Day, Fourth of July scenario where they frighten the heck out of everybody and start blowing up cities. In the beginning, anyway. Mm-hmm. They're, going to, they're going to pose as our friends when we are ready as a, as a civilization on the planet to accept it. When we're asking for someone to solve planet Earth. And that your people will will want it, will cry out for it like they did in Nazi Germany, you know, pre-Nazi Germany, because Hitler didn't take over Germany. Mm. He, uh, he helped them, all those people who were unemployed and needed, you know, all that. He helped them, and they ran to get him into office. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, even the Bundestag fire was like our 9-11, you know, with the Twin Towers. Yeah. It was set up to make people pass legislation in Germany that would put him into absolute power. Which That's he would, of course, yeah. he, he was going to lay it down, uh, but uh, obviously he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're we're headed for the same thing here in the states and in a number of other countries. But um, you guys down there in Australia, goodness gracious, I, I've still got a son. He's he's out of the army now, but he's over in Perth. And we talk about this frequently, uh, him and his SAS buddies, um, about the Indonesian problem. I mean, you yeah. know, they're creeping in all over the place in the north, and eventually. They're going to come down and take over, you know, probably above the Brisbane line uh, Mm -hmm. of Australia. And I don't know if we'll ever get them out, but that's your problem. They're going to be pressing on you as soon as the United States is in such trouble that it can't defend the Southwest Pacific. Yeah. And And that time is – sorry. No, you're right. I I was going to agree. I I used to work with with a gentleman whose father was actually part of the defense ministry. Right. Australia. He said, "He said those are this is the most likely scenario for invasion for Australia uh, for for our listeners. So this is this is true stuff, guys. This is happening." Look, they taught my son, and this is the crazy part about it, he was being taught tactics against how to fight Indonesians, when in the next room the Indonesians were being taught the same tactics. Can, can you believe that nonsense? <laughs> that sound, it sounds incredible. Um, I've been watching uh, a story uh, an unfolding where the U.S. are populating all of the bases to surround China, and, there, and the U.S. is also part of the Indian Ocean um, Security Commission. Right, like not just the Pacific, like it doesn't. Yep. The U.S. doesn't join the Indian Ocean in any way, shape, or form. And, and I've been watching that unfold since uh, when was it? December last year, Mickey, mm, with um, right, yep. yeah, well, the introduction of all these troops. It's a form of hegemony, but you know, because China hasn't joined the New World Order, they are, uh, you know, the U.S. is participating in that to try to surround them so that they can bring them into the fold later. You know, kicking or screaming or whatever, but. Um, mm-hmm. That's what it's doing. We're spreading out like that, and we're spreading very thin, uh, very thinly, I suppose, is the proper grammar. But anyway, uh, when America 
it falls from within. When we have civil war here, disobedience, martial law, uh, some nukes go off, tactical nukes in some major cities, and people panic here, which they will be doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, our overseas activities that people are going to demand here, stop, come home, you know, we don't care about the rest of the world, we've got problems here. When that happens, all this base surrounding China and stuff like that may not be as strong, and Australia will have to defend itself. And let's face it, your government has not made that uh, you know, a practical idea. They've just not funded the military in any way. Yeah, we've got nothing. We're, we've been actually buying troops. This is one of the stories. We've been buying troops from all the other countries. You're joking. No, I'm, I kid you not. Um, up in the Northern Territory, there's been uh, flights of uh, troops being landed in, and the government declared that they're not... American troops. These are not foreign troops being landed, and that's because we own them. And they're establishing these this this line across the the top of Australia. It's an extraordinary uh, story, breaking story with this. Look, I, I, while I, while while you're talking about civil war, I wanted to to throw this to um, uh, you know that it looks like the the U.S. government's preparing for another civil war, and. If you add up the, the FEMA camps, the ammunition purchases, which, by the way, aren't UN approved, they're hollow tips, armoured vehicle build-ups and tanks for urban warfare without treads, they've got wheels. You know, and there's also the steady decline of the 30-year mortgage rate uh, down to zero, which is now. Yep. Yeah. But that's, if you haven't seen it, everyone have a look at it. We'll post, I think, the image is on our website. Um, what, what do you see? This is, is, this is the point, isn't it? This is the point, and the U.S. dollar, uh, from this point forward, will continue to uh, devalue and rapidly toward the end of the year to the point that it'll be heavily inflated. And it's already hitting the gas uh, uh, pump prices here. And people that aren't following what's happening are thinking, well, why is our gasoline costing us more at the pump? You know, the price of oil hadn't gone up. Well, it's because the U.S. dollar is falling, and we can't buy the imports as cheaply as we did before. And um, when we hit that super inflation point where people say, hey, gold and silver have gone up, let's sell it. Okay, so mm-hmm. you sell it, then you buy inflated currency that's inflating on an hourly basis. Yep. Uh, what are you going to do with it? Oh, well, I put it in the bank? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, actually, it's going to disappear very shortly. There's going to be a banking crisis, and there will be a bank holiday to get around this problem of this severe inflation. Oh, what will happen to my money? Oh, gone. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the only thing people can do is not the gold and silver stuff. It's the things that that would buy. Fuel, generators, power, food, medicine, lead in a little brass case with a primer on it, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and lead will become the, the precious metal of the day. Uh, you know, I mean, people just do not think ahead, you know, far enough in the chess moves, and they're going to get caught. But by the time they need to enact any of that thing, it really will be too late anyway. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. We're so, going to a global currency. That'll have to happen when the new world order sets up. They've already put it in place. So, so yeah. So, what is the end game then? Right. I mean, what are we looking at here? Is is, is it we will be human cattle, uh, just just to serving our I guess extra dimensional masters, as it were, or? Mackie, I you know I'm amazed that you use that word uh, human cattle. Because in translating, uh, retranslating parts of the book of Daniel, which I did in 2010 for the last edition, final edition of the Cosmic Conspiracy, I looked at just eight verses in the book of Daniel in the Hebrew, and I had to go to some Sumerian and, and words and some Babylonian words and stuff that they used, that Daniel used or was given to use by God. In there, part of it talks about the the little uh, g god satan as he he makes himself a god to the antichrist of this age the antichrist respects him but he doesn't worship him he doesn't worship any god except himself he he gets the big head and part of what happens when he makes a deal with satan is this and is it as it says in the book of daniel satan looks at humans as fodder that's like food as fragile clay vessels to crush so he says to the antichrist here, I'm going to give you this technology to overthrow anyone who opposes you in the entire planet. In return, I want certain lands and people for me. And out of the ten nations that will make the whole world up, you know, the ten regions, which is in page 200 of my book, 
some of those, and I don't know how many, will be given over to Satan and his his guys for their own uses. And when it used the term fodder, when I translated that, that almost looks exactly like V was talking about where the eight people. And if <laughs> we recall, in, in the Genesis account, the giants did, they were um, cannibals. They did eat mm-hmm. humans. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it, it certainly suggests that. That's horrendous. It is. And that day is upon us very soon. People are going to really be unhappy that are in the uh, quote-unquote alien or Satan-occupied countries. I don't know what he's going to do with them. I, I haven't finished translating all that stuff there, but I'm encouraging other people to do it. And once we found out how to do it, uh, to uh, get through the book of Daniel and start digging all this stuff out. It took me three months with just eight verses because I, I didn't know how to do certain parts of it. And then I realized how it was coded. But, mm-hmm. uh, oh, it's spooky. Spooky. It, spooky. It, it sounds spooky. The... The uh, I've been I've been following you know uh, Sitchin and uh, I'm a big fan of Jason Martell's work, um, and that really it it led me down this path to the the Sumerians and the Sumerians' tale in you know uh, of the Anunnaki and the return and. And once you once you get across that, you see how like it is to the Bible. Yeah, and understand this: there are only about eight or nine people in the world, as far as I know today, that can actually reasonably translate the Sumerian uh, script. Mm-hmm. And um, each of them will have a personal bias from their life, you know, about how to interpret certain things. I understand. So, so Sitchin's work will be close, you know, his interpretation of it, but allow for some differences to be just the way he thought, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so um, how far have you gone down that road? Well, I'm not studying Sumerian. I haven't got time for that nonsense. It, it's, <laughs> that's a life, it's a lifetime work. And quite honestly, uh, what's written in the, the, the Bible, in the ancient Hebrew, once you start digging it out, is sufficient for what we need to know. And then, of course, in the New Testament Greek that agrees with the Old Testament, mm-hmm. that tells us how to deal with what's coming and you know, what to do. That's enough. I, I, you know, life is too short for me to do all that at once. Oh, uh, well, yeah. I, <laughs> I, yeah, I know. We, we have hard enough doing our job and doing a radio show. I don't know how anyone else does it. The, it, 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 looks, it looks to me, though, even NASA agreeing, and there's some you know, scholars around that are suggesting that they're, they're talking about a, the same event. Anyway, and that's, that's, yeah. a great, that's a great step forward. That that that's been admitted, and I and I really I really like that. Um, uh, just one last thing on on the UFOs, for instance. The, I've heard it. You know, have you heard about the Walmart UFO, the huge building-sized UFO that was seen, and that lady and her family that we're talking about are, are gone now um, for Where some reason. And when uh, I think it was uh, Texas or something like that. It was huge, and it's in the same area as the aerospace companies um, when? themselves. When? Oh, I'd have to. I'd, I'd have to get back to you on that one. Years, months, or what? Oh, years. Well, because there was one. There was one reported in about ninety, ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety seven, ninety eight. Mm-hmm. That was reported live over the Coast to Coast AM show with Art Bell. Uh, I was listening to the program at the time. And a woman did say that, you know, she was standing under it and could see it passing over, and it was passing and passing and passing, and it was huge. Now, that was in Texas somewhere, mm-hmm. so that, that might be what you're talking about. Yep. Let me let me tell you part of the, the magic of, of these big ships. Our engineers and our physicists that have come through university have all been taught that the amount of fuel to make a rocket support an object that size in the air for 10 minutes over one spot without moving is just astronomical and couldn't be carried on board such a craft. Mm-hmm. Not not only that, they say that a craft that big, say a mile in diameter, or mile wide, whatever, the craft that big, the, the metal or whatever they use to connect the various parts together in the struts would sag under its own weight just in normal gravity, and not to mention making sudden, rapid, you know, high-speed moves, it would fall apart. Yeah. Now, I argued this point uh, convincingly uh, with uh, a professor of physics at the University of West Australia in his office. 
I use his blackboard and his chalk. <laughs> and I said to him, okay, so this is what your, your official position is. I said, so we can't take a heavy craft and, say, park over um, a runway out here at Perth Airport for 10 minutes or more. It would just take too much fuel. Yeah, not if you're not moving anywhere and just sitting there, yeah. I said, what about a hot air balloon with a crew on board of that? Oh, that's a different thing. That's Well, that's specific gravity. That doesn't count. <laughs> and I said, oh, but if we could form an electronic balloon around our craft and store energy in there to make it lightweight, then it could sit there and not use any fuel because it's recirculating in the thing. Uh, well, that, no, that, uh, well, that can't be. And he took his chalk and he threw it at me and I ducked and it hit the chalkboard and broke up and, and that was the end of the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds familiar. Oh, doesn't it? What? But anyway, these guys, <coughs> these guys cannot allow for that in their paradigm. Mm. They've been trained that way. Mm -hmm. But here's how it happens. If you can take, a, say, a 30-foot diameter saucer, and you can make that work, and, of course, all the members of that are, that's a small aircraft. That's not very big. And we build those bigger than that all the time that get at supersonic speeds and whatever, things like that, and they don't fall apart. So suppose we make one flying saucer with uh, anti-gravity in it and throughout the crew and the craft so that everything uniformly accelerates and doesn't break. Well, now, that's not a mile diameter craft, but if we take those 30-foot diameter crafts, a bunch of them, and we put them into a framework where they're all touching, and that, and we can control all of those 30-foot diameter craft fields at once together, you know, from the control room, then we make anti-gravity nodes all over the ship so that the, the greatest span you have of any strut trying to support itself in inertial changes is only, you know, 10 or 15 feet. And that, yeah. Okay. You see. You see. Then we can make these big craft, make them do magic, and the the uh, engineers and the physicists will go, "Holy cow! That's mm -hmm. not from around here." You know, it's <laughs> out of this world, and that will fool even them. And the people will say, "Hey, if they're fooled, uh, I'm with them. This is something big." Yeah. But but see, this is interesting because I mean, you know, the way you explain it, it makes a lot of sense to me, but. You also touched on something else, and this is really where the question then comes in, right? This, there seems to be a knowledge filter which keeps that information out of people's minds because they've been trained a certain way, right? And, and we believe this is a, a concerted effort. This is, this is not coincidence that these things are happening, right? Absolutely. Why do you think so many physicists, uh, physicists and uh, UFO-related uh, type uh, professional people that wanted to tell secrets disappeared or died or whatever before they could get it out? Mm -hmm. Some of them got, you know, inducted into programs like I did, and then they have to get away. But, you know, uh, the majority of them just kind of disappeared or died. And that's why, because there was a lid put on it, and they wanted to crush people so they could not uh, be believed if they did get to the, to the press, you know, discredit them, or that they could not speak because they were dead. I'll tell you something interesting. I could visit the United States when I was in Australia, because uh, I, I flew through here uh, with... Um, RWB Productions, when we filmed, uh, filmed the uh, documentary on Tesla, um, the, the Eye of the Storm. And uh, I was allowed to have a green, uh, or like a, a visitor's visa pass to get through the United States transiting, but I was not allowed to come home. They took my citizenship away, they took my uh, passport away, and I was, in essence, put on prisoner island there in Australia for 30 years until the State Department released me. Huh. <laughs> Didn't know that, did you? No. <laughs> Yep. That's, that's, True story. Uh, <clears throat> like you know, I, days, you know, Devil Island. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I chuckle about that now, but that's exactly what it was. I, I have always wanted to be working on one of those programs or be being involved or being shown what really exists because I've always said that I will never talk about it again. Uh, you know, I can run around the outside of it barking at it, but... You know, once I'm let in, that's it. I, I'm, I'm done. I don't need to talk about it anymore. It's, it, this is a personal voyage for me, yeah. But you know, I, I think, I think the dilemma becomes, well, why can't we release some of this and save people? Why can't we have free energy? Why do we maintain our, you know, dependence on oil? These are all the questions that come up, right, Stan? It's, it's, it's a lot bigger than you might think. Um, when Sir John was telling me about a, 
uh, you know, and Sir Henry about the uh, they were moving in on us, uh, the aliens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I started doing some investigation after that, and I found out that the cotton tops all over the world, you know, the the old guys, are in the Western world are still fighting the Crusades. They are wanting to burn up the Arab oil, so the Arabs have nothing to trade with, and they're totally destroyed as far as spreading Islam across the planet. We have plenty of oil capped off in Australia, in the North Sea, in, in America and Alaska. Well, you know, Alaska is part of America, but in, in the north there. But it's going to be used more for plastics and medicine because when the free energy, quote-unquote free, mm-hmm. uh, cheaper energy is released, they're wanting to control it on a, a planetary level so that you can't use that energy except with one of their devices, which is monitored, and you can't pay for it except with the digital you know, the number, an ID. Mm-hmm. You won't have folding money or, you know, coin or stuff like that. And they want to win the Crusades. The last Crusade now being the Western uh, Judeo-Christian nations will finally defeat the, the modern Saladin the Greats, uh, you know, the Great, uh, in the Arab uh, community over there. And that's, they were fighting this war, and the Arabs found out about it because <laughs> the, the New World Order guys of the West uh, pulled a, a trick on them saying, Look, you guys have got so much money in, in the banks, you know. Uh, why don't we uh, give you some power with that? Why don't you uh, put it in the World Bank and uh, let us invest <laughs> it? We'll invest it in South America, America, and the in the uh, the countries that have got oil and and other resources the world needs, gas, and you can own those too. Oh, that's a great idea! So the Arabs rushed in and put their money in the bank accounts of the World Bank, and it was put over into South America. Oh. A military overthrow occurred in this one, then that one, then that one. Who was doing that? Uh, CIA, I think. Oh, well, sorry, guys. Uh, all your money was lost, and the new military hunter did not recognize the debt. Sorry. Great. And with that, the Arabs realized, we're being kind of done. So they started to then invest their money through proxies into Western nation corporations and share market to gain as much control of those things it to counteract the Western uh, economic structure's attack on them. And that's all been going on behind the scenes. And believe it or not, this is a religious war b- between them. Uh, I, I couldn't I couldn't believe it when I first discovered it, but that's what it's about. It makes sense, though. It really does. I mean, uh, I guess people have now forgotten the Crusades, and then uh, I guess in the in the 17th century, how close the Turks came to, to taking over Europe, I guess, and that, that's, that kind of fear. I imagine would have stuck in, into people's bones to some extent. Well, you having your background would certainly uh, realize that more than pro- perhaps a lot of people didn't uh, uh, be raised in Europe. But, you know, yeah, I mean, the Turks came very close, very mm. close. In fact, I almost, I almost thought that, that, you know, that their empire was, uh, you know, one of the latter-day empires, but it didn't quite get strong enough to do it, but they came close. Yeah, and no, I, I agree with you 100%. So it's really, it's, it, it truly is a clash of East versus West on that level at least, right? Yeah, and we leave China out of the equation because they're the sleeping giant over there. Very quiet. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Don't wake the dragon. <laughs> well, they're going to wait. Look, they're going to wait until the East and the West beat the crud out of each other in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. And when we're, you know, the East and the West are down to their lowest level for a lot of reasons, tired, run out of money, uh, soldiers dead, uh, economies in shambles. Then China can move in their troops into the Middle East on rail lines that they already have laid with locomotives, steam locomotives that were designed by a, a British engineer. They're double burner, double boiler steam locomotives. Each wheel in the locomotive weighs 12 tons. Wow. And these things are already in place, a number of them. One of my friends that I that was a partner of mine in business actually went over there and saw them in China. And uh, this was, gosh, what, like 25 years ago. <laughs> and the they've been r- uh, running the rail line so that they can take the troops up through and through the Himalayas and over into the Middle East. And that's how I think the biblical uh, forecast of like, you know, 200 million strong army is going to happen. China will have other allies and between them. They will have 200 million uh, strong army and they can get them there by train real quick and get them into the area and start mopping up. That will be the Battle of Armageddon in the Jezreel Plain there in northern Israel. <laughs> That's when the good Lord, good Lord steps in and melts them to the bone. Mm. Incredible. I know. It, isn't it great to be living in this in this time to actually see things happening? 
Well, this, yeah, it is. It is <laughs> going on yes and no. <laughs> it's terrifying. To be honest with you. It's, it's, you know? I say that. I say that to Holly occasionally, and she says, "You're crazy." <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I, I believe strongly that. Um, and this sounds probably crazy. That I've always felt. Dave is the same way, I guess, that, you know, there's more to this and we have a certain purpose. And now with this show, this particular radio show, which reaches, you know, several, uh, I guess, several layers of people and, and tens and maybe even hundreds of thousands of people, there's a certain message we have responsibility of carrying, uh, certain information we feel responsible for to, to make public knowledge. Uh, this is really right. our, our mission, if you will, mm-hmm. you know, right. to, to, to bring that out there. And, and having guests like you to, to lay it on the table. This is what it is, guys. This this you know. Uh, you can see it um, unfold as we speak. Well, let me uh, underscore my participation in this and say this. These are my opinions, and some are personal experiences, and nobody died and left me as, you know, in charge of teaching everybody, but I'm sharing my thoughts, and the surprising thing is that you guys have the same thoughts without even talking to me, and this is really cool. Mm. Oh, absolutely, and then other people we've spoken to are all coming to, to similar conclusions if not the same, uh, and some even the same, uh, from very, very different places. Right, right. Actually, yesterday I was up uh, 50 miles from here north here in Colorado Springs at a, uh, a Christian prophecy conference for all the leading lights, you know, in the United States, and one from New Zealand, actually. Uh, Chuck Messer lives down there now, and he was up there at the at the conference and delivering a, a lecture, and uh, Len Marzulli, uh, L.A. Marzulli, and uh, Tom Horn, all these are, you know, well-known lights here in in uh, the United States for the Christian pro- uh, prophetic witness, and I was so amazed. I went to the Marriott Hotel there up in, in the mountains, and they had parking for maybe 1,200 people. All of the parking spots were taken. Plus, they had hotel guests that were there just for you know, hotel visits, and they had overflow parking half a mile, or sorry, a quarter of a mile away. People had to walk from there to get to this conference. Everyone was talking to each other. I watched and listened to groups of people in the lectures, you know, and outside in the halls. There was nobody arguing. If they had a different viewpoint, they said, well, okay, well, I see your thing. Well, that's interesting. And they were all basically on the same page and happy and not fighting. And at the same time that these lectures were being recorded, they were being broadcast and simulcast all over the planet. I, I don't know where it all went. I have huh. never seen such a coherent, large group of Christian believers in this country in one place at once. I mean, it was. I'm going up there tomorrow for the last day of it. Uh, it's just, just incredibly stimulating to find you know like minds all in one place mm. there's no there's no shortage of conversation i mean i tell you what we've just oh <laughs> <laughs> uh lips were flapping boy i'll tell you it was good that sounds it sounds like an amazing experience hey i've, I've seen a couple of things uh, some interviews that you've um you've had a, about and uh that's you know what really led me towards you and i've I've um, you know, the anti gravity video was captivating to me, and and that's you know, uh, without this show, I, I don't think I'd have an opportunity to talk to you at th- this level. Um, uh, do you still have the same? Do you have still what what views do you have on you know like uh, solar flares and and earth changes and the things that we're 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 also staring down? I had had to say also, in compared to everything we've already spoken about. Well. Look, um, NASA has stepped in this year in this solar cycle, the mm-hmm. sunspot cycle, and they've named it a few years back the Grand Solar Maximum. Yeah. Now, I've been trying to figure out what prompted them to say this because the sunspot number of this cycle is not exciting. It's low. Mm. It, it's not large. So what are they talking about? We've never had a solar sunspot cycle called Grand in the 300 years that we've been recording it or whatever. Uh, actually, there's some of the records before that, but uh, the official sunspot stuff that we accept is about 288 to 300 years. Now, why did they do this? Well, we're having a double peak. We're we're just uh, coming off of this current peak of sunspot count. It'll diminish a little bit toward December and then go back up in 2014 and, pe- and peak out later in 2014 if all goes as planned or thought that will happen. Mm-hmm. But what we are seeing, instead of increased sunspot numbers, is in the corona the, the coronal mass of, of the sun we're seeing holes in that large areas opening up that you don't normally see in the sunspot areas but you have to look at, at different frequencies coming out of the sun you can see these huge holes and these are breeding grounds for x-class flares and uh, we just came out of one that covered nearly a third of the northern hemisphere facing us and this the, the, the cycle is not over so i think they know more than they're saying 
because the sun is, is since 1992, it's been emitting new frequencies in the ultraviolet spectrum. Therefore, this sunspot cycle is a very, uh, very high priority one to fulfill biblical prophecy in the book of Revelation about the sun increasing its light output like seven times. It's not the infrared so much as the ultraviolet, but seven times the light. A cloud going around the sun, and the sun could pass through a, a dust cloud in space. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole the whole system could pass through it. Or the sun itself, in phase state changes in its nuclear chemistry, could produce clouds of debris around it that are there for a short period of time until it blows them away, which would then diminish the sunlight to us. But that cloud has to be big because it's going to diminish the starlight to us here on our planet as it diminishes the moonlight. So it'll be between the moon and the earth this dust cloud wherever it comes from that that's i'm pretty sure it will be a function of the sun itself uh throwing off debris changing its uh fission fission reaction now into more of a fusion reaction because it has already used up half of its hydrogen fuel and has to go to a helium reaction now mm-hmm. i mean the Rus- russians said that some time back yeah uh, so uh, th- these things are a matter of record that's that's where we are and and i believe that we are going to see coronal mass ejections solar flares um, just from the sun, this is not from warfare and stuff like that that creates the CMEs, uh, you know, the, uh, sorry, not the CMEs, the EMPs, mm-hmm. which will fry a lot of electronics across the planet. Uh, we're going to be cast back into the horse and buggy age, uh, depending on where these uh, EMPs strike, and primarily it'll be here in the United States, I think, from external forces. It, d- it depends on what season. If it, if it comes in your winter time, we'll be close enough to to feel those effects i'll tell you that you know it's um the one was the last one 18 something and it made the telegraph wires arc yeah it was called the character event that's, that's right. it yeah, yeah. If, if we see another one of those every single thing that we we hold dear to ourselves right now in the era of mobile technology <laughs> well, it's, it'll, it'll be all gone yeah think about this the united states is in a horrible position at the moment because they have about 2,500 super big transformers that run the entire power grid in this country. Each transformer to be rebuilt takes at least two years. Mm-hmm. If those get shorted and blown out, you know, any number of them, the Chinese are the ones who build it for us. Uh, think about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're in a bad position. And everybody else, it depends on the Chinese making these super transformers for the grid, is in a bad position. Think about this, Dan. Uh, China just bought our power production what yep it used to be state owned and now it isn't yeah so if if you were an invasion force how do you disable them turn the power off if you own it you can do it well that that is that is frightening Mm mm-hmm yeah, so, and that would be clever because you turn the power off, you don't destroy infrastructure and electronics, they just don't run for a while until you get in and turn it back on and you're in control. Exactly. <laughs> wow. So well, I, I, I did... was complaining I was complaining about the uh, it's either the Spanish or the French own all the parking meter revenue in Denver here. And I'm thinking <laughs> Well that was bad, but what you're telling me really is bad. Yeah. That's why I've been following this story so closely and it's it's Dang. absolutely in- extraordinary. What are your leaders doing in Canberra? Oh, S- selling everything. Well, they're selling really good farming land as well, you know. So mm-hmm. it's, uh... Yeah, I worked on a farm over in West Australia years ago when I was on the run over there. And I know the farm I worked for used to tell me when I was going around the bend, you know, uh, cutting, uh, you know, uh, the crop. He says, now, look, don't cut the corn too hard there on the wheat because you're going to starve a few uh, uh, Chinese families. You know, it's not Australian, but Chinese families because it's not mm-hmm. going to be here. That's exactly right. Uh, I mean, look, my son is uh, in engineering and stuff. He's up in uh, the west in the mining districts there, and the Chinese are just all through there. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, they're, it's they're just smart. an extraordinary they're thing. In Africa as well, they're, 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 yeah, no, it's, it's, you're right, with the end game in, in mind, that they're, they're doing it a smart way around. Well, the Chinese are obviously going to try to get footholds and stuff they need, the key resources and strategic defense positions or aggress positions for when the East and the West have beat themselves to pieces, you know, the Muslim and the Judeo-Christian groups, and then they can step in. They're doing the long game, the long run. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you know what, Stan? It is, I, I can't believe we've come to the end of this show time. Oh, <laughs> it's, my it's goodness. It's a bunch of interesting subjects. Look, this happens frequently when I do shows here. 
uh, you know, we'll look at the clock all of a sudden, and, you know, two or three hours have gone by, and it's because these are things that we're interested in, and there are just so many questions that come after so many questions that come after so many questions, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's we want to know these things. You're right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And, and look, uh, thank you so much for your time today. I can't thank – really, we can't thank you enough. Uh, hey, guys, listeners- want to do it again sometime? Let me know. Oh, definitely, 100%. Guys, uh, out in Listenland, if you liked it, please remember that freedomslips.com is listener-supported radio. Um, so if you wish to make a donation, please do so if you like this content or the other shows as well. Absolutely. And we'll see you next week, Shiny Side Artists. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. <laughs>